record going live hello and welcome to jason cabinets experience i'm your host jason cabinets our guest today is slater victor off slater are you ready to be great today oh yes i am slater is a founder and cto of hope i say this right indigo an enterprise ai solution for unstructured content that emphasizes document understanding Slater has been building machine learning solutions for startups, governments, and Fortune 100 companies for the past seven years and is, free, and is a frequent speaker at AI conferences. Slater, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You know, it's a total pleasure. So Slater, um, you've been involved with tech and startup for a while in the Boston area. Can you give us like a, maybe like a quick overview of what's going on with the tech and startup scene in Boston? Because when you think tech startups, you think, you no. Know, the Bay Area, Seattle, Boston, Austin, New York City. Can you talk about Austin, I mean Boston? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think, uh, you know, maybe maybe to give a little context, I think you always hear about sort of the West Coast versus East Coast mentality when it comes to building a company, right? And, you know, maybe, maybe for folks that are less familiar, you know, the West Coast is all about uh, you know, going really fast, really hard, you know, raising ahead of, uh, you know, certainly ahead of revenue, right? Often above, uh, you know, ahead of a lot of metrics. Um, whereas East Coast is usually seen as being the exact opposite, like really, really reserved, you know, very kind of conservative investing. And I think it's, it's one of the things that's very um, interesting to sort of see how that's evolved over time, right? You know, it used to be that everyone was sort of these very, very conservative, you know, East Coast old money type investors. But I think it's it's funny to see how things have changed because I think both the traditional East Coast investors, if you will, and, and Boston and New York, I think are the major centers for this right now, they're starting to see a lot of the wins over on the West Coast, right? And they're like, okay, you know, maybe we need to reevaluate the way that we are investing a little bit. But at the same time, you know, you've got a couple of those really embarrassing failures on the West Coast that are like, okay, maybe we need to slow down a little bit. So, you know, I like to think that we're getting beyond that West Coast, East Coast rivalry. And I think, you know, really just, uh, I mean, I, I'm East Coast biased, obviously, but, but I think that there's a lot of wisdom to be taken from both sides. That's a great point because like I have my own startup. I'm in Seattle, mm -hmm. but uh, I got to accept a program called NYU Future Labs in New York City. It's pretty much a year. Oh, cool. Pre-COVID, it's supposed to be like a free year of housing, free year of a uh, office space in Brooklyn, and of course nice. I, they have a lot of a lot of lessons learned. And it's always like kind of like not like, kind of funny, right? Like West Coast has one way to do things. I, I get advice one way from the West Coast people. Advice that's kind of different from the East Coast, you know, and they kind of like like both shade each other sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, time, no, right? for sure. Yeah, I mean, and you know, everyone's everyone's got a everyone's got embarrassing stories in their closet. I figure, right? You know, like I could sit here and I could, uh, you know, I could talk about Juicero all day, right? Or I could talk about, you know, IBM all day. You know, depending on which coast I'm sitting on. Yes. Yeah. So next, talk about your role as an angel and an advisor. Oh yeah, yeah. So I mean, that was um. You know, I, I think it's one of the things that is really easy to appreciate having gone through the process of, of kind of creating a company, right? You know, I'm very much reminded of that term, you know, it takes a village to raise a children, uh, sorry, a child. And with a company, it, it sort of feels like that raised to the nth degree. And I really didn't understand uh the enormity of it, right? When I was starting, right? It's just how many things you have to track when you're creating a company for the first time. And then there's, you know, all the procedural stuff when you're getting started. And then when you're actually running and, you know, uh, here I was, you know, when I was starting Indico, I was this 22 year old college dropout that was, you know, going head to head with IBM and Google. And the only way you get through times like that is with an incredible community in the ecosystem. Right. So, you know, it was our angel investors, it was our advisors, right? Techstars was a huge help as well as Rough Draft Ventures, right? And they all surrounded us with these great people. And I, I just remember, I mean, granted, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes the first time around. I think every every entrepreneur does, you know, and if I had if I could look back and do everything differently, I, I probably would. And who knows, maybe I would have done everything differently and, and I would have failed instead of succeeded, you know. Um, but I think that the further along I got, right, you know, I'm a seed company, you know, I, I didn't really feel like I had that much value to add back to folks. But now that Indico has seen, you know, some success, now that I've been through, you know, a few really difficult uh, company experiences, um, you know, I, I just advise, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy uh, working with younger founders, right, younger entrepreneurs, uh, younger maybe not in the literal sense, but in the, you know, experience sense, you know, they, they've not been entrepreneurs for as long. And 
you know, if I can help them avoid one bad experience, I think it's all just completely worth it. And so to, to me, it's just um, making companies really, really hard. You know, uh, sometimes I say, I think it's the hardest thing a person can do. And I just want to help because I got so much help myself to get to where I am. So, so we're going to talk about your own company fundraising in more detail a little bit, but has this ever happened to you? Okay, you know, you do you do angel investing on your own. Mm-hmm. Have you ever tried to raise funds for your company and somebody said, well, you're an angel investor, invest in your own company. Like, how does that even work? Like, how do you like decipher that? Or does that, does I that mean, happen? Yeah, I mean, my, my timing is maybe a little a little off, right? Because I think by the time I was, uh, I mean, obviously I've, I've invested, you know, a, a massive amount of my own resources in my company. But, you know, by the time I was doing angel investing, uh, my company was kind of at a stage where uh, my investors, you know, obviously, you know, uh, taking more of my compensation and equity, that's kind of how I put money into the business now. But, you know, our, our cap table is large enough that it actually makes things really, really complicated now if I put money in. But, you know, on the flip side, if I were to make another company, I absolutely would invest in my own company, right? And I, I think that investors are absolutely right to say it. I think it's actually... I don't know. It's one of the things where you don't really have a choice as a first-time founder, right? First-time founder, right? Again, I was a college dropout, right? You know, I was making salary, you know, two, three bucks an hour. I absolutely did not have any money uh, to put back into the business, right? Um, but you know, hopefully, if if this works out well, you know, not to say that I'm have any thoughts of leaving Indico, but you know, I'm not even thirty yet, so you know, life is long. Uh, and certainly, you know, if I were to do another company after Indico, you know, I, I would like to fund it myself for as long as possible. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think if someone pushed me on that uh, and I were in a position to invest, I absolutely would. Um, uh, maybe we'll share some uh, embarrassing stories about stuff I've done to keep Indico alive, but uh, way worse stuff than investing my money. Slater, so as an angel invest, what kind of companies do you look to invest for? What kind of verticals? Yeah, so, uh, and this is actually maybe an interesting place where I'm probably a little bit different than a lot of investors is I'm, I'm really not vertical focused. Um, my real decision criteria is almost entirely around uh, whether I think I can add value, right? Um, what I've started to realize, you know, there's just so many companies out there, right? And I wish I could spend all the time in the world with each one because there is just so much foundational, you know, building a company is hard kind of advice. But... The other thing that I've learned is just that everyone goes through a different path. You know, the world is, is absolutely massive. And, you know, me having gone through the really deep tech, you know, B2B experience, um, my advice is just not going to be that useful to someone who's building a, a consumer driven app, right? You know, maybe some of it, but, you know, I have to think about where I can help uh, people as much as possible. So I really look for people that are dealing with really deep technical problems, specifically in AI. Right, because that's something that I've done before. You know, uh, people that, you know, where the execution of their business relies on advancing the state of the art and actually doing real R and D. Right, and I think that um, a lot of people are starting. You know, deep tech. I would say is maybe it's not a vertical exactly, but I would say that's the closest thing to a specialty that I've got. Um, but yeah, and I mean, it's also just um, some founders just really need help. Uh, and I think that there are, there's that, that founder that's in the perfect coachable zone, right? I would say that's the other thing I really look for a lot is, um, no, for, you know, I'm dealing with first time founders almost exclusively because that's, that's really the experience that I know and, you know, I can help and I can speak to. Um, and, it's really hard to calibrate, right, as a first-time founder. You know, you're getting advice from absolutely everyone, right? You have to figure out, okay, who knows what they're talking about? Who doesn't know what they're talking about, right? And so uh, it's got to be a mutual fit, right? So it's got to be a company where they are well-positioned to take my advice. There's enough of a rapport with the founder that we can have a really honest and frank conversation. I could be like, hey, you know, A, I think you're making a mistake. I think I would make this decision with the business. And also, hey, I think you're making a mistake. But at the end of the day, it's your decision. And so I'm just here to offer it and realize that like, that's not a personal thing. That's a productive conversation. So, you know, those, those are all things that I think are really, really important for me to look at. Um, time does come down to it. I would say right now I'm, I'm an advisor and an angel investor at as many companies as I can really hold. Uh, but, you know, things change all the time. And, you know, those companies, they get big and, you know, they get to a point where I can't help them as much anymore. Yeah, that time there, I don't think entrepreneurs realize how much advice they're going to get once they start right. Yeah. Wow. And, and a lot of it is really bad. Um, I, yeah, I have to say that that's one of the things I definitely think I, I messed up my first time around, right. Is, you know, you get absolutely 
covered in advice from everyone, everyone from, you know, your grandmother to your high school friends, right? Everyone's suddenly an expert in, in how to run a business. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, I think one of the other things that was really tough is that I had to, you know, an advisor comes in and they've maybe got a really impressive resume and a long, uh, you know, rap sheet, if you will. That's a strong indicator that they know what they talk about, but it doesn't mean it 100%. Right. And, and I would say those were probably some of the biggest mistakes we really made early on where there was someone that, you know, maybe they had a really, really great background. And so we thought, you know, we have to have this person involved in the company and we didn't pay enough attention to, you know, hey, is it the right cultural dynamic? You know, do they know our business? Right. Really getting into those weeds. So I think the, um, you know, seeing past the star power in a lot of ways, you know, I think that's one of the toughest things for early founders to get over. So Slater, what do you see a lot of entrepreneurs do wrong? We just like want to say all of them say, stop doing this. Don't do this anymore. Oh God. I mean, so my, my number one issue right now is that uh, everyone wants to be an AI company, right? Uh, and now I, I obviously, I do diligence for, for VCs a lot. So, you know, I am uh, very likely to be the person on the other side of the table if you're pitching your AI company. And everyone wants to say they've got some special algorithmic, you know, advantage. They did some magic secret sauce that no one else can do. Um, I want people to just absolutely stop doing that. Right. I mean, yes, you know, technical advances do happen. Certainly. Right. Um, they were extremely rare uh, in the ML space in particular. It is moving so, so quickly. I know if you're pitching me, you know, fundamental algorithmic advantage, there's one of two possibilities. Either, and this is far more likely, you just don't understand what's out there in the space. So someone else is doing this. You just don't know about them. that. That's very likely. It's a big space. Or, or less likely, uh, you're actually right. You know, you actually do have a totally novel, you know, algorithmic advantage that's better than everything else out there that exists today. Uh, and, you know, no, that means you're competing directly with Google and Facebook and literally every big tech company out there. But let's say you succeed in all that and you still have an advantage. The space moves so quickly that your advantage will be gone in six months, right? And, and, and I really wish that I saw, and I think a lot of people do realize this when they're building the company, right? They say, hey, you know, state-of-the-art approaches are really, really good. And, you know, really rapidly adopting what is state-of-the-art is actually a great strategy. And you don't have to make the argument that you're better than everyone else. You're just, you know, applying it in a different way. Uh, but I, I wish more people would take comfort in that kind of pitch, right? Because, you know, if you try to make it seem like there's some, magic there and there's not, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's really transparent and you end up doing yourself a disservice, even though you, you know, it, it's really easy mentality to get into, right? You want it to be super, super special, but I think, um, you know, it, investors know what it's like to make a company. And so it, if you try to make things seem better than they are, uh, you're not fooling them, right? You're just making them think that you don't have an appropriately realistic view of your business. So do you think some founders say they're AI or deep learning because they know that makes themselves look sexier to investors? hundred percent. And they're like, they're, they say, well, we're not this now, but our business do this in three or four years because, you know, that dynamic. Yeah. And then I, it's I mean, like you said, they're I, being, People you know, have been doing it for, for, for a decade at this point, right? And it's, uh, yeah, I, I just wish people would stop, right? Not every company has to be AI. There's, there's super interesting stuff that you can do outside. And, and if you say it's AI and it's not like, I'm going to get called to the meeting, right? And I have to figure out that, you know, that's actually not the interesting part of the, the business. And again, it's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, maybe don't pitch it that way. So what makes a business AI? So, uh, I, I mean, it, it's a good question, right? And maybe a tough one to answer in, in absolutely all cases, but I'll, I'll give you my, my personal view on it, right? Is that, um, Implementing AI, right, and, and having that integrated as a key part of your product, I want to maybe separate that from, you know, doing AI, which I think um, more specifically refers to, you know, advancing the state of the art and, you know, building, building new things in the AI space. So I think on the left side of that, right, there's actually quite a lot of intelligent applications there, right? And I think that's either uh, anything where you're doing intelligent decisioning, Right. So, you know, based on some user interactions, you know, you suggest A or you suggest B, right? Anything of that format, right? That's, you know, that's an AI feature for sure. Um, and, you know, the other ones obviously are anything where you're taking significant information in from a user's interactions to build up a more sophisticated view of them, right? So those are 
it's not like those are uh, requirements for AI. Those are just examples of, uh, of AI applications. And a lot of things happen to fit those molds. So I would say, you know, look, anything where you've got uh, an ML model in place, right, and, and it's learning over time, and it's doing something that a person would normally do, like, that's AI. I, I think AI is, it, it's a broad term, and, and I'm comfortable with it being a broad term, though it is, it is a moving target. I think that there's a really important difference, though from, hey, I'm paying attention to the AI space and I am grabbing what is being produced and I'm shipping it to, hey, I actually have an AI company. So I, I think that's a, that's a totally different bar, right? To say, hey, I, my company is an AI company. You then have to convince me that you are advancing the state of the art there, right? Um, and, and again, that's different than saying, I have one algorithm that is, that is better than anyone else. It's saying, you know, I've got a path, you know, I'm state of the art and we've got a direction that allows us to, you know, effectively move forward with the, with the rest of the industry. Um, so, you know, examples of this, uh, Clarify, I think is a good example. I just use them because, you know, they started about the same time as my company. Uh, computer vision. So they basically say, look, uh, we have the best computer vision out there. Uh, they don't claim to be the only people that have, you know, the best algorithms, but what they've really done over time is they've built up a really, really deep understanding of the user problems that are connected to the algorithms. And this is kind of my, my you know, contrarian opinion, if you will, is I think using state-of-the-art methods in an AI company today is almost a, a, an ethical obligation. It's like you should use the best techniques. And then the interesting questions become who is using the best techniques in the way that is most aligned with what users want. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, so maybe next, a weird view, but uh, <laughs> no, no, that that makes a lot of sense. Next, can you talk about? I think it's called Four Four O Six Ventures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Four O Six, you know, just to give uh, you know maybe listen, listeners a bit of background. You you have a bit of background. So they were um, one of the uh, main investors in. Uh, Indico's first seed round. Uh, they, they're today Indico's lead investor, uh, certainly. Um, so, you know, and I'm an EIR there as well. So, you know, 406 is a largely, you know, they're an enterprise software uh, firm. You know, they're primarily Series A uh, with a really deep kind of expertise uh, in, you know, AI, data, security, you know, that kind of whole space. They, they also have, you know, a significant uh, healthcare uh, business, right? But but I, I don't know as much about that stuff. That's uh, different partners over on their side. Um, and the thing that I really like about them, actually, um, do you know uh, do you know where the name four hundred six comes from? No. So this is this is a really good one. Um, oh God! And, and, and folks that know me well know I'm absolutely not a sports fan, so I'm, I'm going to probably butcher the details on this. But there, there was a batter uh, for the Red Sox, I believe. Uh, and he had a really, really high batting average. Yeah, you're talking about Ted Williams. I know you're talking about Ted <laughs> Thank Williams. Thank you, yeah. Ted Williams. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, his batting average specifically was uh, 406, I believe. And I think that's where they get the number. Now, obviously, that's a really, really good batting average, right? Um, and they have this book open in their office that shows, you know, why was he able to do that? Um, and it was this whole notion around knowing, you know, which balls to swing at, right? You know, what's in your personal comfort zone? What are you really good at as an individual, right? And not trying to hit everything that comes across the plate. So in a lot of ways, that is 406's mentality to invest in. And actually, uh, their, their logo, um, there's this really cool sort of grid visualization of, of Ted Williams sort of batting average for different parts of his batting box, right? And they actually use that uh, as their logo, which is kind of cool. Um, so, so they're all about, uh, again, companies that they really know they can add value to um, and that, you know, series A state or sort of establishing product market fit, you know, they're really big fans of uh, companies with real technology. You know, I would say, again, they're, they're, they're pretty broad in how they define that, but they're, they're a lot more tech centric than a lot of other firms. Uh, and I don't know, they're, they're just great partners. They, you know, they care about founders really earnestly. And, you know, I've been working with them for over half a decade at this point. I'm, very, very happy with them. So Slater, next. So recently, your company was uh, named one of the top 20 machine learning startups to watch in, I believe, 2021. Yeah. Uh, that has to be a big deal because I read an article. Like, I knew there was a lot of, like, AI startups, but I didn't realize how many, many there were until I read the article, right? So that's oh. a big deal for you. Oh, yeah. I, I was very, very happy with that. Um, I, I, I got to tell you, you know, if you thought that was overwhelming, you know, there's a, there's this group that publishes a canvas of the AI space uh, every year. And I mean, it's just, 
the space is, I mean, it, it is exploding in a, in a crazy way. I mean, such that, you know, for every little segment you look at now, there's, there's a dozen companies. Um, so no, I mean, we were really, really happy to be, be named that. I think that, you, you know, honestly, Indico is not particularly good at marketing from a company perspective. You know, we, uh, you know, we're this, I mean, you know, granted, you know, we raised $22 million uh, at the end of last year. So that was definitely a big part of it, right? You know, we've, we've making some really big strides forward on the commercial side. But what I think a lot of people don't realize, and I think this is a lot of the reason that, that we got that, that award, is that the technology that we're building, right, and sort of the core AI that we're developing is, uh, it is meaningfully advancing the state of the art. Right. And what I really mean by that is when you look at the stuff that, you know, Google and Facebook and OpenAI are doing, right, I mean, those are Indico alums, right? I mean, GPT, right, Alec, Lad Alec Radford, the, the lead author on that, you know, he, he was one of the old Indico founders. And, you know, we are, you know, we've had past collaborations and we've got advisors from, you know, Facebook and Google and, uh, you know, kind of all of the really top AI organizations. And so, you know, I, I, I would really like to say I hope that in the future, the fact that we've got good technology is, is a smaller part of the Indico story relative to the value that we're adding to our users. But I, I do think that that was a big part of why we made that list. So Slater, so AI, machine learning, deep learning, are these all different names of the same thing? Are they different things? Can you kind of explain that? I, that's, yeah, that's another great question. And I think you'll, you know, you ask this question to 20 people, you'll probably get 20 different answers. Um, but, you know, I, I've got a way that I like to look at it, which is functional. Uh, I like the AI definition that is, really anything that a computer is doing that a human would traditionally do. Uh, the reason I, I like that is because it, it acknowledges fundamentally that AI is a moving target, right? And, you know, maybe uh, 100 years ago or, you know, 200 years ago, I think a calculator was AI, but today it's, it's definitely not AI, <laughs> right? Or, or, you know, you think about like a, a thermostat, right? Or, you know, th those kinds of basic, basic things. Um, and I think, you know, we'll get to the future. And again, you know, that, that line's always going to move. Um, so, so there's that. And, and actually data science, I think is perfect because I think if you asked me five years ago, I think everyone would agree, uh, data science is AI, right? That's where a lot of the, uh, advances uh, were happening back then, right? That's where a lot of folks were getting out into ap uh, applications, but today, you know, that, that's, uh, it's maybe a controversial point, right? I think a lot of people, and I, I'm on the fence here, right? I, I don't, I don't feel super strongly, but a lot of people would certainly argue that data science is, is so well established at this point, right? And the practice is so uh, consistent that it's not really AI anymore, right? It, it's, you know, it, it's statistical tooling for what is uh, today, you know, again, a, a primarily technology driven process. So Slater, then, yeah. So, so the average American be worried that AI is going to take their job from them and talk about future work. No. So I, I think that like all automation, there's going to be a period of adjustment for sure. Um, and actually, this is one of the places that I talk about, you know, what we do very, very differently than other folks. I, I really like words like augmentation and acceleration a lot more than automation. Uh, you know, I think people do have this mentality of, you know, an Android is going to come and sit next to me and, and, you know, do some work like a human's going to do it. And, and we're just, we're not only are we nowhere near that vision, Right, but we're starting to realize that maybe that's fundamentally the wrong way to think about it. Uh, and actually, I, I'm very much in, in that camp. I actually think that when we look at the intelligence that we can build really, really well with modern AI systems and the kind of intelligence that humans are really, really good at, um, we can train the AI to mimic the humans. We can actually do that really, really well, but it, it almost seems to me to be a, a waste of time, right? I think it's much more interesting to look at systems where humans and AI are working together cohesively, you know, so rather than the Android analogy, I really like to think of these as, you know, cybernetic implants, bionic arms for knowledge workers, things like that. Um, so I, I think that's going to be a lot more likely. I, I think the thing that I am really, really nervous about, you know, existentially from AI is, you know, it's programmatic bias. And I think what people should be more worried about is people shipping AI models into production uh, without sufficient safeguards. Right. I, I'm seeing that all the time today. And I, I mean, uh, you know, coded bias. I don't know if you've seen the documentary, but uh, Joy Wallamwini over at MIT, you know, did absolutely great work. I think everyone knew that facial recognition was uh, biased. Everyone knew that. Every single researcher on the planet knew it. Uh, what we didn't know was that Amazon was going and selling it to police departments. Right. Uh, and I mean, when I learned that, I mean, I, I, I don't know. 
it really makes me worried for for our future as an industry, right? Like if people don't have even, it's like an it seems like an obvious ethical test to me, right? I mean, yeah, and then obviously they failed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like ba- badly, right? Right, quite badly. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm optimistic because there are people like Joy and, and, and Timnit out there, right? And they are calling attention to these issues. Um, but look, from the inside, you know, Indico is trying to fight against this, but um, people are not rigorous, right? P- people are not taking the care that they should be before shipping this stuff into production. So later, let's switch to your fundraise, fundraising. So you, you've yeah. successfully raised a C, A, and B round. Can you talk yeah. like, you know, was the method of your process the same each time? Do you have to change the process up? Like, Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, this is maybe another good piece of just uh, uh, entrepreneurship advice is act your stage. Um, I think that that's another place where people go, go wrong is, you know, when you're doing a C pitch, don't, don't try to sound like a series A company, right? When you're doing a series B pitch, don't try to sound like a seed company. Um, and you know, so seed company, right. Just like go through them quickly. Really what seed companies are about are I've got an awesome team and a cool idea and it's interesting and other people aren't, aren't doing this this way. Right. And that's, that is all you have to prove. Right. Uh, because like seed stage, it's so early. No one knows what the truth is going to be. You just have to have a, a good shot at it. Uh, a, very different, right? The A is much more this notion of, okay, great. You know, we've got a product, right? We've got a market. And maybe in the A, right, you don't quite know how to get them to mesh together, right? But you've got, you know, some interesting technology, some interesting proof points, and you really want to figure out how to make that repeatable. And the series B is about, okay, we've got product market fit, right? Like we've got the product, people love it, you know, great. You know, there's still going to be stuff that we have to build, but you know, there's a mesh, the engine is running. And then the question becomes much more, okay, now we have to scale our sales motion, right? You know, it's this question of going from, you know, a couple million in ARR to, you know, like adding a zero to the end of that. Uh, and, you know, there, there are obviously more nuances to that as, as you go on beyond it, but it, it's just think about, you know, what is the macro question that you're trying to solve in the next stage of your business. Um, not that the next stage is always getting to the next funding round, right? I don't think that's a, that's a great way to think about it, but whatever the next stage is, whether that's profitability or, you know, uh, getting a particular product release out. And did you do most of your fundraising in the Boston area? You know, every, every time uh, fundraising happens, we end up taking a trip out to the West coast. Um, you know, we, uh, yeah, I, we don't have any West Coast investors uh, right now. Um, you know, we've talked to a few. I think there's good ones out there for sure. We have gone away from the East Coast. So we've got folks sort of across, uh, I would say, the Eastern half of the country. Um, and, you know, obviously all of our investors have presences on the West Coast. But I would say, you know, if you talk about West Coast investors, you know, the, the Sequoias that are known as being West Coast firms, uh, you know, we haven't, uh, we haven't taken money in from those folks. Uh, but, but, you know, we always stop in to say hi. <laughs> uh, at a certain point, you know, uh, probably probably in the next round, right? Uh, that's going to change. Slater, how, how do we make STEM more inclusive, and what does that even mean? Oh God, yeah. I mean, so okay. Uh, let me maybe do the reverse forward, right? Because I think what does that mean, and what does that look like, is is easier than how we get there. Because uh, you know, if I knew how to get there, I'd be doing that instead of this. Um, you know, I, I think that, I think that STEM is taught very, very badly, um, at most levels of education. And I think that especially in K through 12, uh, I think that the selection we're doing, you know, the, the anti-selection sort of gatekeeping to STEM disciplines is actually leading to, you know, the, the opposite of what I want in, in graduates, right? Uh, just as, as an employer, right? So I think that my, my biggest problem today with STEM education is that I think the, the reality is that when your project touches the real world, complexity and difficulty jumps up by a factor of 10. Um, And it jumps up in a factor of 10 in a way that's not easily learned in a lecture. Uh, And I think that for for different fields, this is probably very, very different, but for engineering specifically, right? So let me, let me talk about that because STEM, again, it's broad. I don't want to make it out to be a monolith, but, but engineering in particular, I think that 
project-based education and education that is much more oriented around the the eventual end goal of engineering, you know, building a product that people enjoy. I think that would go a long way to making the space more inclusive, right? Uh, and so this is actually maybe something that's a little weird in how I talk about STEM, for instance. I think part of the issue is that we've got the notion that STEM is like this really neat box and there's technical people and non-technical people. And I just kind of think that whole thing is, is nonsense. Um, we consider our product team to be a part of our engineering group. Right. I believe that a UI designer is just as technical as a uh, you know, backend software engineer, right? but in a fundamentally different way. And I think that you know, people often ask me when I stopped being an engineer and when I started being an entrepreneur, and I tell them, no, I never stopped being an engineer. Right? Being an engineer is about going from an idea to reality. And so in so many ways, I think that engineers focus too much on idea to prototype. They don't realize that that is a very, very small part of the overall goal that you're trying to achieve. And I think in some ways, entrepreneurship is almost the purest form of engineering, right? So how do you turn this into something that is that is self-sustaining, right? And really uh, kind of a much more holistic approach to stuff. So, uh, you know, how we get there, like I, I think project-based education is great. I came up that way. Uh, the K through 12 education system did not work for me. I, it is a miracle that I got through and got to college in one piece. Um, just, just barely made it by the skin of my teeth. Um, but it, it changes quite a lot. I think once you're out on the other side. Yeah. I think one thing we have to fix too, and I'm not smart enough to fix this, but, and I can get these numbers wrong, but I think I remember reading or hearing somewhere a while ago, like, you know, in, in elementary school, uh, females are 80% of them interested, interested in STEM. By the time they get high school, it's down like 13% where like boys pretty much stay the same level. Right. So what's happening through those years? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, one, one of the, uh, and actually, uh, uh, my school, Olin, is, is kind of a, a hotbed for a lot of this research. So, so Olin, uh, purely engineering school, 50-50 uh, gender ratio, um, but, you know, approximately, it, it changes a bit. But, you know, obviously, that, that's very rare in engineering. And I think Olin, obviously, they, they made a really, really good name for themselves as just producing higher quality engineers. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, whether I want to call attention to the gender ratio in particular or the broader initiatives that, that Olin has around trying to facilitate uh, diversity and accessibility in STEM, I think it's clear that steps in that direction, right? And, you know, obviously the commitment to gender equity is a big piece of that, right? Olin also does a lot, though they could certainly do more around scholarships and financial aid. Uh, so it used to be a full scholarship for everyone, but now it's down to half plus financial aid. But I, I think just those first steps towards equity and inclusion have resulted in, you know, I think Olin creates, you know, it's like 3x the number of successful companies of the, you know, next biggest school, which is Stanford, you know, as a percentage of their graduates. So, it, I mean, it's clearly working, right? And there was a study that I remember saw, I saw post up outside of one of our professors' walls, and it was the saddest thing I ever saw, um, which was they looked at the difference in SAT math scores. Uh, on two sides of a policy decision in Colorado. And the policy decision was whether only college bound uh, students would take the test or whether all students would take the test. And when you looked at the results, uh, when it was only the college bound people taking the test, you saw a really big delta actually in sort of the math scores uh, between, between different gender identities, uh, which, you know, of course, you know, people back in the 60s or whatever this was are like, see, you know, like women are bad at math. Then, and this is the part that, you know, again, th this is the tough part, is uh, then they had everyone take the test. What they then found was that actually women slightly outperformed men in the math section. And, and, th and that's bad, you know, in a few ways, but, you know, it, it's, for me, it's one of those things where the more I thought about it, the worse it got to me almost, right? Because what that was telling me is that, you know, we built a society where it's not that we're just pushing women out. Right. It's that we are creating a society where the smartest women are realizing that they should take a different path. Right. And it's just like, I don't know. We've got a lot of problems to solve as a society. And, you know, th this notion that, you know, we should be gatekeeping and pushing it out. I'm just like, look, it is all hands on deck here. You know, we have problems to solve and I, I don't care where I get the help from. Right. But it feels like at sort of every step of the process, people are, are picking and choosing for me. Yeah, I don't know, it's rough. Uh, yeah, I agree. And then like, you know, you know, obviously I'm not a female engineer, but I know some female engineers and they're always the, the only female in the room, right? So 
that be engineer and then have to have the challenge of being the only, you know, female in the room because they have to be having the extra pressure on them, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, we, we do a lot around diversity. And again, you know, I'm not a female engineer. My, my partner is a female engineer. Uh, so, you know, I, I've talked with her a good amount about it. You know, we, are, we care quite a lot about diversity at Indico, but, uh, and that's one of the things that sucks so much about it, right? Being in, in a company's position where you're hiring. You know, I look out at the job market and by the time you hit the job market for, you know, a senior engineer, you know, that gender bias is already so baked in, you know, I get, if I'm lucky, one in 10 candidates coming through the pipe is a woman, right? I'm just like, you know, and we do things to, to you know, make that more appropriate because actually, um, apparently if you have just one member of any minority in a hiring pipeline, they're actually uh, just as unlikely to be hired as if you had zero because you always, you know, associate them with just being that and people get too confused to make a decision. So, but I guess, yeah, I don't know. Even with all that, it, it feels like you're playing a losing game, right? It feels like we're just trading horses here and no one really wants to talk about the elephant in the room, right? Which is, well, I, maybe it's not fair to say no one wants to talk about it, but I feel like K through 12 education in the United States is, is failing us really, really. When it is in STEM in particular, right? But, but I think broadly, uh, it's just, it's not working. Yeah, you've been a good point. Like a lot of people say, well, no, diversity hiring just hire diverse people. Well, it's not that easy, right? First, I got to be qualified. First, they got to, you know, apply for the job. First, you got to recruit them. It's, it's, it's a whole dynamic, right? And, and bottom line is like diversity hiring is great and all, and you need to do it, but you still got to hire the best person, you know, if you can, right? With people yeah, on well, that, and it's, it's not easy. Like people think I, it is. It, it, it's, it, yeah, it, it's not easy, right? And again, you know, I think it's, it is important to push companies to do better because they should do better. Right. But as hard as we push, right, there's only so much we can do because by the time it shows up at, again, the hiring pipeline, you know, you're playing from behind. Um, and again, there's, I think, a lot of new opportunities showing up. You know, I think boot camps are great. Those are definitely helping. I think companies are realizing that, you know, they can reach earlier and earlier into the pipeline if they've got good, you know, processes to, to train people. Um, but again, you know, you're still playing from behind. Like no matter what you do, you're going to be playing from behind compared to, hey, you know, can we actually talk about the fact that we don't teach programming in K through 12 education, and it is 2021? Yeah, that's just, that's, that's crazy. Really, that's so ridiculous. It's it's absolutely insane. It's absolutely crazy. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, I think everyone needs to help here, right? I think we've clearly got ourselves, you know, uh, up shit creek, so to speak, on this one. Um, I would really like to see more happening in the K-12 space. So Slater, take changing subjects. Next, talk about MMA and martial arts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is a fun one. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I uh, sorry, I, do you have a do you have a lead-in or I can uh, No, yeah, just, go, just, just, just walk away. Okay, all right, all right. So... Um, you know, I've always loved martial arts, you know, I think that, um, I don't know, this is one of my, uh, we're talking about cultural issues I've got with the engineering space. That's another one. Engineers are terrified of getting hit in the face. Uh, I don't think it's nearly as bad as they think it is. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think, um, like all things growing up, right, you know, I think my, my parents, you know, they wanted to find something that they loved and I loved. My dad was a big musician. He was a drummer. And you know, love listening to music, got no talent for it, right? Um, so, you know, we, we tried around, you know, cooking was really good for us, but martial arts was, you know, one of the other ones. And it's not like my dad is a fighter, right? But, you know, we had this place in the neighborhood and he, you know, he realized it was something that I, I enjoyed. He kind of really supported me in that. Um, and, you know, I found myself at the end of high school, I, I sort of mentioned, you know, I, I barely made it through, uh, but, you know, I had just a very, very intense academic, you know, intellectual, uh, you know, high school experience, you know, I did a lot of really, you know, challenging extracurriculars in, in the STEM field. Uh, and I took a gap year before school as that, that's a story for another time. Um, and, and that was something that I, I really decided, hey, look, I, I really want to, you know, get more in touch with my body. And I want to, you know, really turn this year into a year where I'm spending a lot of time doing martial arts and really improving my practice. So, you know, I did a lot on my own, just studying different different uh, spaces. You know, I had done uh, mostly Japanese martial arts, uh, mostly karate. Uh, you know, a little bit of Aikido um, and a little bit of Korean martial arts, uh, so Tae Soo Do. But you know, you know that's a very small portion of the world of martial arts. Uh, so I started studying Chinese martial arts. I actually spent two months uh, studying uh, Xin Yi, which is a it's like 
it's called Chinese boxing. Sometimes it's like a colloquial name. It's not a really, it's like halfway between boxing and, and Tai Chi is maybe a good way to, to talk about it. Uh, and then I ended up doing MMA competitions as well. Right. Yeah. I, um, saw, I saw a picture of you in China training. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it was probably the frattiest experience I ever had, but uh, you know, those folks are friends for life. Yeah, like I was in the army for 25 years because you do like a combat training. And you're wow, like, people, don't, yeah. people, people don't realize how like uplifting and like freeing it is they hit in the face, right? It, 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 you know, it really is. You know? is. It doesn't sound like it sounds like crazy. Like, are you kidding me? No way that's not <laughs> uplifting, right? But it's like kind of like exhilarate, like, you know, like like you're alive almost, right? Honestly, the biggest problem I have, uh, or I like just as a fighter, right? You know, you're not supposed to talk during a fight. That's like a big no-no. Uh, I would always like compliment folks when they would get one in on me, right? Because, you know, you're like, you're going back and forth, you know, you have like a really nice bout and like someone just gets you clean across the face. Like part of you is like, wow, you know, like that's rough. I need to back up. And then part of you is just like, wow, you know, that guy got me. You know, my guard was down. Uh, I know I, I used to call him out on it, but uh, no, so, I, and it was actually a, my partner is actually also a, she's a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. So that was actually a, a big piece of that as well. So you're actually a professional MMA fighter. You do like amateur. No, not, not a, for, not a professional. Just for, just for fun. I, I did a couple amateur fights back in the day. Uh, but you know, it's, it's been a few years since I've done anything serious. You want to get back into it? You know, I think about it. I think about it a lot. Um, I think the problem is a couple of times I've tried, you, you know how it is, right? I, I'm used to being a lot fitter than I am. Uh, and so it's like my body can go through and like yeah. it remembers what it's like. And I'm like, oh, you know, I, I can't quite move like that anymore. Your, your mind remembers, but your, your body's not cooperating. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, I, I still do, you know, I still, you know, I still keep in shape, you know, I still, I still practice a bit, but, um, you know, I have thought about it. I think the place that I, I would most focus on is uh, my ground game is awful honestly you know i've got a friend who does bjj here there's a couple of good bjj gyms in boston so i have thought about it uh and there's a couple of good mma gyms but um i don't know i asked me to get in a gear maybe, maybe i'll have uh, finally broken through and how long did you spend in china was it only those two months so you have more experience it, it was just a couple time. months in china okay. uh but i had you know spent more time studying chinese martial arts on on either side of that i, I would you know it was a great experience i would love go love to go back that's definitely uh another one on my list so Nick, can you talk about what's called the fourth industrial revolution? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is a, wow, you've been, you've been digging deep, yeah. Uh, so fourth industrial revolution, uh, I, I think a lot of people use this uh, to talk really generically about AI, but I think this was a really big piece of, of Indico's early pitch uh, to be sure, right? Um, and, you know, people talk about the industrial revolution really generically. I think what people don't realize is there were actually a lot of different phases to it, right? You know, I think a lot of things, again, we look in the rearview mirror, it feels like it was an instant of time, right? Someone came up with a steam engine and then suddenly modern society, right? Really, really not the case, right? And so people have started characterizing things. Now, the steam engine, you know, everyone has heard about that. Obviously, the computer, you know, information age, you know, that's another industrial revolution. It's these, these fundamental technological breakthroughs that uh, are exciting at the time, but still take decades to be fully borne out, right? Uh, again, I don't know, computers is a great example. That's the one that I think we, we just finished, right? That's the most recent industrial revolution. And, you know, first transistors made in the 50s, thereabouts, right? You know, people are seeing in the 50s and 60s where this can go, even 2000, Right. I mean, remember Y2K. And, you know, I do think that as exciting as technology is, people realize that it's still it takes time for things to move. And I think that AI is what's driving the current, uh, you know, this fourth industrial revolution. Right. And I think just like every technology in the past. Right. Uh, you know, people thought computers were going to be mostly used for, you know, as, as recipe storage for housewives. Right. You know, people have a lot of trouble seeing the potential of technology once it's widespread while it's still in its infancy. You know, I think we're, we're about a decade into that for AI now. I think people are realizing that there's real stuff here. It is starting to transform the way we do everything. But I, I think what people often don't realize is that we're 10 years into what I still think is going to be a 50-year journey, right? I, I think that while things are advancing faster, there are still laws of physics and for a fundamentally new technology to become ubiquitous, that doesn't get that much faster. Uh, maybe it'll be 30 years instead of 50, who knows, right? So Slater, this company that Elon Musk has, this Neuralink thing, is that AI? Or is this no, different? no, Neuralink is, is not AI. Um, 
you know, Elon Musk was involved in OpenAI. That's that's another that's another that's another conversation. Um, look, I love classic Elon. I absolutely, you know, SpaceX, Tesla, you know, PayPal, SolarCity, great strong companies. I did, I think he did an incredible job there. Um, I think that Elon Musk has gone off the rails in recent years. I, I think that a lot um, of people think, are saying that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and I totally get you know, the counterpoint that, you know, that is what innovation looks like. But I think that I have a slightly different diagnosis, which is that I think that's always how innovation starts. Um, But I think that being in an innovator's shoes, um, the only way you turn an interesting initial seed of an idea into a really successful business like Tesla is with a lot of resistance. Right, you know, and, and it's almost that that action of of taking that initial seed of inspiration and you know refining it under under heat. You know, it's like forming this diamond over time. And I think the problem is that Elon is actually he's missing that key element. Is he's too successful now, and so when he comes up with what could legitimately be a really interesting seed idea, he doesn't get enough pushback. Right, he gets a bunch of yes men saying, "Oh, this is so great!" You know, like Elon, you're so smart, and then he ends up with that you know embarrassing embarrassing one car tunnel in Vegas, right? Uh, it never would have happened to old Elon. Yeah, and remember a, a little while ago, he was selling flame, flamethrowers. Like you think he was saying, yeah, was say, absolutely. do not sell flamethrowers. Like there's nothing <laughs> to what you're trying to do. And, but he sold like, like thousands of them, right? Absolutely, right? And, 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 and I think mean, someone yeah. would say, Elon, what are you doing, guy? Like, come on now, like. Exactly, right? And, and, you know, on the one hand, I gotta be like, you know what, dude, you know, you made your success, power to you, you know, it, you are allowed to like go crazy. Like, you know, you can Howard Hughes it, you know, at this point for all I care. Um, but, you know, like maybe, maybe keep the line crisp, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey uh, Slater, going back to 2016, you either wrote this article or you recorded an article, uh, existential crisis in AI and finding one's path. Yeah. Do, 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 is that, you still have the same beliefs from back in 2016? Have they changed any or? Goodness, I mean, so that was that was a really that was a really fun article. That I mean, that was probably one of the you know I've been in a lot of media, done a lot of talks over the years, but that and that was with uh, X Economy, and it was Jeff Jeff Angle who who wrote that. Um, it was one of the most ex- fun experiences I think I, I ever had. So I do. You're gonna have to remind me a little bit uh, what on earth I believed back then. Um, yeah, I don't have that in front of me. Yeah, that, that's fine. No, yeah. I, I think I think the generic terms, right? And, and I think this is something that I still do very much uh, think is true: is that in, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, exploring AI can turn into an exploration of the self. Um, and so, so let's uh, let's take the Turing test for example, right? Because I think I think a lot of people are familiar with the Turing test. Is you know, I want to be able to have a chat conversation with an AI indefinitely, and I want to believe that it is a human forever. Right. And people say, okay, you know, this is a test for whether or not we've attained artificial general intelligence. I, I, I don't believe. I, I actually think the ter- Turing test is terrible. And let me tell you why. Uh, and first, let me give you an example. Let's say we have a chat conversation and I say, hey, Jason, um, I want you to fly over to my house. It's in Somerville, Massachusetts, right? And I want you to knock on my door. Reasonable thing for me to say, right? Are you going to do that? Probably not. Uh, but, but you know, if you've got an AI in that situation and the AI is like, no way, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, it, it doesn't really understand. And so it starts to ask this question of, okay, um, and I think this is the paradox in a lot of ways, is that we want AI to solve problems in new and interesting ways. But at the same time, when we see it solving problems in, in new and interesting ways, we say, no, actually, that's the wrong solution for, for whatever reason. Right. Um, and, and maybe uh, one one other uh, good example of this is there's this problem of telling the difference between huskies and wolves. And the AI says, OK, great, I've got, you know, a thousand pictures. And it learns that really the best way to tell the difference is you always take a picture of a wolf against snow and huskies you take a picture of in your backyard. Right. So, you know, it, it builds a snow detector for the background and, you know, whatever, it's 100 percent accurate. It can always tell the difference between a husky and a wolf. Is that a wrong solution? You know, of course, as a human, we say, well, of course, you know, I wanted it to tell the difference between huskies and wolves. Well, it sort of did that, as well as you defined the problem, at least, right? Um, and there's not, there's not an immediate answer to that question, 
right? It's more to ask the question fundamentally, which is, look, you know, in a specific circumstance, if I looked at it a particular way, the fact that it's relying on snow, actually, it can probably figure out the difference between huskies and wolves by relying on snow better, way better than I as a human can based on looking at the dog, right? So who am I to say that that's a, a wrong solution? And, and yet clearly, there's some nagging part in the back of your brain where it's like, but that's not what I meant. And I think it's it's emblematic of the paradox of AI, right? I say that we have on the one hand, you know, these incredible examples of brilliance out of these systems, while with the other hand, you know, even a child can poke at one of these and find examples of stunning ignorance. And I think we still don't understand why there is that gap, right? And, uh, you know, it's a source of discomfort because it's both an issue with humans. Like we're not, we're clearly not framing the problem correctly. We don't understand how to frame the problem correctly. Um, and, and it leaves us searching a little bit, you know, like what is that grain that, that makes us human? And I think, uh, I think we can, I think we can look for it in a lot of places where it doesn't necessarily exist. So later, so my point of view, you do a great job putting yourself out there. Like you, you, you're, on, you're on YouTube videos, you do LinkedIn posts, you know, social media. And I think as an entrepreneur, you got to do that. But it seems like, in just my opinion, some entrepreneurs are not doing that, right? Why do you think some entrepreneurs are like, I don't want to say scared, but like are hesitant to put themselves out there? Uh, I mean, I also think a lot of them are a lot better than I am at it. Um, but no, I, I think you just said it, right? They're afraid to put themselves out there. And putting yourself out there is a terrifying thing. Um, and I don't know. I think the first thing that I realized that was the most helpful thing for me is just realizing no one cares. Right. It's like, look, you put something out there, you know, I, I put a LinkedIn post, right. And you're like, haven't built your following at all. Like no one is going to see it. Right. No one's going to comment on it. Right. It's just, it's like a drop into the ether. And it's actually, it's really comforting to realize that because you're like, oh, well then I, I can just give it a shot right now. You know, like make sure you've got your, your morals in place and all that. Like, don't say anything like, like really, you know, bad, but yeah, I don't know. I think, I think that in so many ways, like I believe in the the phrase, like there's nothing to it but to do it. Um, yeah. and I think it like it's the same way as like making a company, right? It's like everyone I talk to, it's like, oh, you know, I'm thinking of making a company, or I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm waiting, uh, for, the I'll always I'm remember waiting the, for the I'm waiting for the perfect time to get started. Exactly. No, no. I I just remember the best piece of advice I ever got, and I was you know I was in the lunchroom, and Katie Ray, who is the managing of director of TechStar, she's like super high up fancy person, I'm this random, uh, you know, like undergrad, I sit her down, I give her this long pitch on a company I'm thinking of making. And, you know, she's very, very patient, you know, sits through, you know, whole 10 minutes of me, like, I just, I found her in the lunchroom, right. Uh, and then she just turns to me and she says, you know, very simply, great idea. Why aren't you doing it? And, and that was it. And she walked away, right. And I just sat there. I was like, oh my God, I don't have an answer for that. And then I found a Nidico. So um, I don't know. I, th I think there's there's people that can get behind that mentality, and uh, certainly it's terrifying, right? But it's not going to get less scary. So next, this is like a several part question. So first, okay, great. your product roadmap is it as complicated as I think it, it think it is? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's... Ne next part is um, how do you go about doing your product roadmap, roadmap, and then like how often do you update it? Yeah. So yeah, for, first I will say, yeah, I mean, the, the product roadmap is, is pretty complicated. Uh, you know, I actually, and, and maybe, maybe this indicates like, I actually think the R and D roadmap is a lot simpler than the product roadmap for us right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, look, it, it's a big product. It's, it's enterprise software. So there's a lot of, of critical aspects. And I think even more than that, it's, it's a new space, right? So for every problem we're solving, right, we're, we're making 10 new ones. Right. It's like, OK, great. You know, everybody uses it. And, you know, we've got millions of documents flowing through the system. Awesome. Now we need metrics. OK, great. We've got metrics and, you know, people are updating it and we've got all this. OK, great. Now we need like workflowing for the metrics and visuals for So, you know, it's like everything you solve, it sort of digs you that that far deeper into the problem. Um, so in terms of how we prioritize. Right. And, and it is always tough. You know, we've got a. Uh, motions. So, you know, we have a yearly product planning motion and, you know, every quarter we've got a quarterly product planning motion where we say, you know, this is the plan. These are the major features that we're, we're planning to get done in the quarter or in the year. Uh, obviously the yearly ones, not very accurate, right? Um, you know, we go into every planning session, I think, with a really pragmatic mentality that is like, look, no matter what we decide here, um, it's going to be wrong in three months, most likely. 
right? You know, if we make a prediction, you know, six months from now and everything happens like that, that is, that is awesome, right? That very rarely happens. So we also have a uh, biweekly sort of reprioritization meetings, right? So, you know, we've got our quarterly for every department, we try to keep it down to one thing, your most impactful thing that you're trying to do. And then the idea is just, you know, how do you make enough space to make sure that gets done? And also realize if you have to pull the ripcord at some point, just be like, look, you know, we're gonna kill ourselves trying to get this done by the end of the quarter. We've got three more things that are actually more important, you know, and sometimes that's the hardest part is learning when you've got to, you know, take a step back and, and take an L on a particular objective to make the whole thing succeed. So next, let's talk about your company in more detail. Can you yeah. tell us like how and why you got started, what you're focused on right now, and what is your, your vision for it going forward? A hundred percent. Yeah. So, you know, and this is the part where I would love to tell you, you know, I was sitting in a dorm room with, you know, my best friend and we sat down and we drew an arc for the next seven years and everything went perfectly according to plan. Uh, but no, you know, uh, not nearly that simple. Uh, so have you ever heard of the, the site Kaggle? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Kaggle, Kaggle really is where it started. Right. And, you know, for, for folks listening along, Kaggle is this crowdsourced data science uh, website. You know, people come, they upload their data sets and, you know, we would compete against some of the top PhDs, some of the top researcher and, and you know, top industry folks in the world. Uh, because, you know, whoever gets the best accuracy on, on this test, on this data, they win a cash prize. And, you know, th that really was the genesis. And I'll say I was in 2012, I had this quote that I said to my professor, I'm never going to forget it for, for the rest of my days. The war is over, deep learning lost. Right. That was the quote. Uh, it's 2012. Now, obviously, I'm eating crow in a real way now. Uh, but but in 2012, that was actually it was not a weird position to have. So when me and my friend Alec, right, we started doing these Kaggle competitions, I was all about my traditional ML techniques, right? You know, I was writing SVMs, right? I was, you know, coding custom LSI techniques. Um, and, you know, he was a he he was an early deep learning devotee, right? I mean, he saw the potential there in a way that that I didn't. And after about six months, something really interesting started to happen, which was that I couldn't get any advantage with any of my traditional techniques. It was every single thing I would come up with, you know, I'd come up with a submission and he'd have some deep learning technique that's like, oh, yep, you know, it handles that, it takes care of that, you know, that isn't needed anymore. And look, after about three months of this, I frankly got pretty sick of it. You know, I, I don't like losing. I, I'm a competitive person. And he was, he was wiping the floor with me. Uh, and so I switched teams. Right. I mean, I, I was a convert and that was that was the genesis of Indico in so many ways. Me saying like, look, I, I was wrong. I was completely wrong about deep learning. Um, it's, it's not a panacea. Right. I mean, it's not a magic technology that's going to fix the world. Whatever, right. But but for, for a particular task of problem in the AI, AI space, it is just it is so much better than anything else that I, I, I honestly, I almost saw it as a moral imperative. It's like, look, if this is in a, a mission critical situation, you know, you have to use the best technology. So then we tried to bring deep learning out to the enterprise. You know, I, I was running a small contracting company at the time. Uh, and, and, and we started bringing it out to folks and saying, hey, look, you know, ship this into production. This is going to solve your problems. And we realized that the academic framing of the problem and the industry framing of the problem, they, they were so far apart that they were almost unreconcilable. Right, you know, this technology, and again, we had seen the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know, we know the incredible potential of this. But, you know, that, that, was, that was really the, the genesis of Indico, was us saying, okay, how do we solve this problem, right? How do we bridge that gap? How do we take deep learning and fundamentally turn it from, uh, you know, an academic technology that requires a PhD to operate and, and transform it into something that's actually accessible and explainable to even non-technical individuals, right? Uh, you know, First, first pass, we didn't think that was even possible. We said we're going to make it accessible to developers. But now after seven years, you know, our vision has grown pretty, pretty dramatically. And so that is what we are here to do, is make the most complex technology on the planet accessible in an understandable, transparent, and empowering way to non-technical users. That's, a, that's great. Um, as an entrepreneur, I know you got a lot going on every day. How do you purse like every day, make sure you focus on one, two, three, a priority list instead of number, something on number 100 your priority list? <laughs> Gosh, yeah. I mean, that that is a that's another great one. Uh, I'll, I have two two pieces of advice. Uh, one is you got to recalibrate your expectations. Um, I think that you know I go into days sometimes with to do lists, and you know early on I used to get frustrated if I didn't get my to do list done. That's not a reasonable expectation. Now my expectation is if my to do list gets shorter and not longer, it's a good day. 
so so that, that's one piece is you just have to realize like that is a part of the game new stuff is always going to come up and so long as you can keep your eye on the prize and make a little bit of progress each day that really is the name of the game uh, and then I think the second piece, right, and I, I forget actually who, who it was that asked this, uh, but it is a kind of famous, uh, a famous quote a little bit, right, which is, you know, you're, you're juggling so many things, right, how do you make sure you never drop anything, and the response is like, no, you know, that, that's not possible, like you're going to drop stuff, um, just when I'm juggling so many balls, I have to know which ones are plastic and which ones are glass, right, and it's like, which things, you know, if, if I screw up, is it going to be okay? And like, I will be able to recover, which things really like, no, like if I let that miss, it is over. And I think that's really the, I think that's one of the other really, really important things is that there's, there's macro planning, but then there's the, I have 30 minutes and I need to get something done. And it's really, really important. How am I going to use that 30 minutes sort of like on the ground planning? It's just like, what's the next thing that's going to break? So it's like, like some entrepreneurs, they, they brag about working 100 hours a week. You no, know, I have a friend who like he works 21 straight days, take three days off. Like me personally, I work every day, but I make sure I take two hours off every day, like do something non-work related. Nice. What, what do you do? Like, and how do you take care of yourself? No, I mean, I think I, I, I don't track the number of hours I work anymore. Um, you know, I think it's a, I, I probably would be surprised in good and bad ways on different weeks about that number. Right. Uh, really early on, I think, you know, I paid a lot of attention to just raw hours and, you know, uh, actually right around when Indico was starting, I ended up working two 120 hour weeks back to back. Um, and I burnt out. Right. I, I mean, again, and I think it's also a, a place where people talk a big game, but. Yeah. Did you really, I, I don't know if anyone, yeah. I don't know if you've ever worked 120 hour week, but I mean, you barely get through to the end. And by the time I did two weeks of that back. So, and the only reason it happened was because I had this contracting company and we had teams around the globe. So I actually had to change my sleep such that I was, you know, sleeping in between major meetings. Um, and I was just like, that is awful, right? That was so bad. And I had to just work, go back to, hey, look, I'm doing nine to five, absolutely nothing but nine to five for, for three months before I could, could get back on the horse. Uh, and I, I wasn't founding Indigo at that time either. So what I, what I do now that I think is a lot healthier is, is a couple of things. So number one, um, I, I'm not really diligent, honestly, about work time and not work time. Uh, I know for some it works really, really well is, you know, here's when I'm on, here's where I'm off, maybe they've got a special area. Uh, it just has never worked that great for me, right? So I, I will do a lot of work after hours, right? I'll kind of go back and forth. Sometimes I have to do some deeper research for work. And then the question of like, is this work? Is this fun? You know, sometimes the question even gets, you know, a little blurry. Um, I recognize that rest is a part of the process. So I think that's the other big thing is like, if I'm sitting there and I'm just staring at something and it, it, like, it's not making sense to me, I, I don't like sit there for another hour and I'm like, oh, I got a soldier on, like I'm on the clock or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm going to get up. I'll make food. I'll come back. Um, and again, uh, I just focus a lot more on work when you need to work uh, and make sure that work is positive, right? Because I think, again, it's just like if you have a lot of those places where you hit a wall and you try to push through it, it almost makes work feel unpleasant. And I, I don't think there's any reason it has to be that way. You know, work is ideally the way that you have your impact on the world. And if you've got everything aligned, it should be a really satisfying process. Um, but, but you know, getting getting that aligned is, is tough. Slater, is there anything that I should I ask you that I did not ask you? Or is there anything else you want to talk about? I don't know. I feel like we've talked about a lot of really fun stuff, honestly. Uh, you know, uh, we could we could talk about a million other things as well. Um, but no, I, this has been a lot of fun. Cool. So Slater, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Absolutely. Yeah. So my Twitter, uh, SL8RV, uh, Indico on LinkedIn. And, you know, absolutely feel free to reach out to me on uh, Encore as well. I take questions. And for our listeners, we have the links to our social media on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshrblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with all your friends. Absolutely. So, so Slater, we're coming to the end of our, our talk. Um, can you give us advice on wisdom or anything you want to talk about? You know, I think... Uh, I don't know, stay hungry, keep learning, you know, stay happy. Remember that's the most important thing. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe that's a little broad, right? Uh, but uh, that's a good advice. If, you, if you check those off though, I think it'll work out. Yes. yes. So later, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.